Hey, good morning. Good to be in God's Word this morning. All right, that's pretty good. We are continuing our series entitled, In Jesus' Name, Amen, as we've been going at a snail's pace through the book of John. We're in John chapter 10. We started in February of 2018. Uh, we'll see when we're done. But we are continuing in John chapter 10. We've taken some field trips, but we want to study this passage today that Ruth just read. And one of the things that I think happens often when we're studying, especially a book of the Bible, is we look at the Bible as a spiritual book, which we ought to. We look at this spiritual book that has wisdom in it to speak to us, which is not wrong. But often we'll strip this book of the context in which the things that were written are said. Jesus did his public ministry in a world that was happening in real time. And history, just like now, was happening before his eyes in that time and our eyes now. But as we've been walking through John, we must not take for granted what Jesus is saying, who he's saying it to, and where he's saying it. He was in a context where there were Pharisees and teachers of the law, these religious people that believed that they were the shepherds of the nation of Israel because they were people who, in their minds, kept the law. They thought they understood the scriptures in their own mind. They thought they knew how to lead God's people. But Jesus came and called them out of what we would call false shepherding. And so I'm going to give you guys the outline for the sermon. I don't normally do this. Second week in a row that I've done this. Don't get used to this. But here are my points of the sermon. The good shepherd protects his sheep. The good shepherd knows his sheep. And the good shepherd sacrifices for his sheep. And that's what we're going to study today, that the good shepherd protects his sheep, the good shepherd knows his sheep, and the good shepherd sacrifices for his sheep. So we're going to jump into verse 11. Let's go. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Prior to this, as we've been studying, Jesus said that he was the gate, and now he's saying that he is the good shepherd. And this is in the middle of a conversation with the Pharisees, and Jesus had used a figure of speech that they didn't understand. So you know Jesus. What does he do when they don't understand? He gives them another example of a figure of speech that they do not understand. Where he uses this metaphor to point out that they're missing it. To point out that they're blind. And how they're in need of Christ's righteousness to be given to them rather than their self-righteousness. Jesus is now accentuating that he is the good shepherd and those who are his sheep, possessive pronoun, he has laid down his life for. I don't know what kind of value you put on being God's. Now, I mean G-O-D apostrophe S, being his possession. I don't know how much value you put into that, but being his sheep, being God's people, that is a wonderful expression of your salvation. When we talk about Jesus speaking of his sheep, speaking of his people. See, God doesn't just save us. He includes us in his family, his people, the sheepfold. He makes us a church. And as a sheep, he shepherds us. As a good shepherd, one who pays attention, he cares for every one of his sheep. And he has called you by name into his pen, the sheepfold. I can't express enough how important it is that we understand that he is the good shepherd. And the best way we understand that he is the good shepherd is by understanding that we are sheep. I'm a sheep. Ooh, some of you remember. And we're sheep not because the pastor said it and we said it back to him, but because we, like sheep, spiritually are dependent upon the shepherd, the good shepherd, to guide us, to clean us, to refine us, and to lay down his life for us in case of danger. One of the reasons we don't see him truly as the good shepherd is because we don't truly see ourselves as sheep. So I can say I'm a sheep, and you can repeat it back, and I can say it, but do you really see yourself as a sheep? See, being a sheep seems derogatory, doesn't it? Bah. -ha -ha. And we don't want to make less of ourselves in the fear that people may actually believe that we're just not that important. Being a people tends to put people off as well. Because when we assume that we are a people, then all of a sudden we lack our individualism. And we think that if we lack our individualism, we lack intrinsic value. 
But just as all four of my children are so important to me, and I cannot even express to you how willing I would be to lay down my life for any of them, even when they've asked me the same question 6,000 times, the same could be said of knowing that we are God's people. Each of us matter to God. We are a family, but we're not only children in this family. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 10 says, Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. It is those who have been forgiven of their sins that are God's family. Not because you're religious, not because you do a lot of religious things, but have you personally been forgiven of your sins because of what Jesus has done? To be his people, I think, in a simple way, is to describe as the people of God, as God's family, they are people that have been forgiven of their sins. They are sheep that are shepherded by the good shepherd. They are those who have received this mercy, those who have realized their need for forgiveness and have received God's forgiveness. And guess how we got it? It was gifted to us through Jesus Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection. That is the only way that we're made righteous. See, when we talk about shepherds, this context in which Jesus is speaking, they would think of David, the great shepherd boy. They would think of Moses. They would think of Abraham when he would speak of being a shepherd. But even though they were important, Jesus would say that he was preeminent above all of them. And Jesus in this passage, including the one we studied last week, said that he was the gate. In other translations, it says that he is the door, which implies an entrance, That's what Jesus is. In order to come into his sheepfold, his people, you must go through the entrance. And he being the shepherd and the door could imply that often when a shepherd would have a flock of sheep, they would go into the sheep pen, the shepherd would put himself in the doorway, that he would sleep there, that he would spend his time there because he would check every sheep as they would go into the sheep pen and he would make sure that wolves would stay out. But as he said before, that there are some that climb over the wall that are thieves and robbers. So here's my first point. The shepherd protects his sheep. The good shepherd protects his sheep. But being a shepherd, this was a low-paying, low-skilled job, but it required courage. It required the shepherd to pay attention and be responsible for the sheep. This was something that was so important that I think a lot of us, when we say that we're a sheep, we don't realize what a big deal it is to be a sheep because that means that the good shepherd is for us and he's leading us and he's guiding us. So even though the shepherd position isn't the most prestigious position, it was important and it was a wonderful representation of what Jesus is to us. Jesus being responsible for his sheep is actually a theme in the Gospels. I think we miss it. We have, over the past few weeks, cut this conversation into these bite-sized passages to help us see that we are his sheep, and those who are his sheep know the shepherd's voice. Those who enter through the gate are Jesus' responsibility as his sheep. They are his, and to an extent, he is ours, and he is our shepherd, and we listen to his voice, and he cares for us. Sheep had a lot of things going against them. So I want you to think in a literal sense for a moment. Think about sheep. I don't know if you've ever hung out with them. I've I've almost been bitten by one. That's all I got, okay? But there were a lot of things that could harm a sheep. Jesus had spoken about these wolves. He had spoken about thieves and robbers and strangers. But see, sheep... They would have to contend with weather. They'd have to contend with rain. They'd have to contend with harsh sun, the cold and the heat. A a sheep would wander off because honestly, let me be clear, we're talking literally about sheep here for a second. Sheep are dumb. That's what they are. They would wander off and get caught in a fence. The shepherd would have to come and help untangle their wool from that fence. They would get spurs caught in their wool and in their feet, and the shepherd would have to come and pick that out, and they would probably try to bite the shepherd because they wouldn't like that it would hurt to get that pulled out. And if a sheep fell over, forget about it. Oh, my gosh. They couldn't get themselves back up because they were utterly and completely dependent 
upon the shepherd. Now, let me remind you that you and I, we are sheep. I'm a sheep, you're a sheep, everyone's a sheep sheep. But we are dependent upon the shepherd in more ways than we realize. We know that we are helpless to enter the sheep pen without him calling us. The shepherd's voice. We can only enter for the right reasons if we hear his voice and follow him into the sheep pen. But did you know that even once you're in the sheep pen, which symbolizes the church of God, God's people, God's family, that you still need the shepherd's help to lead and guide you, to protect you, to provide for you, to clean you up and help you on the daily? See, we talk a lot about sanctification here. We want people to grow into the likeness of Jesus by doing the word of God for the right reasons. That's something we talk about consistently. But hear me, sanctification apart from the shepherd is impossible. Sanctification apart from the shepherd, the good shepherd, the the one who leads us is impossible. So Jesus says in verse 12 that the hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs and the sheep run away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. Enter into this metaphor, the hired hand. As Jesus uses this figure of speech, there are a lot of characters that I hope we understand which each one are and who he's implying that they are and we are. As Jesus speaks to the Pharisees, he speaks about everyone who does not enter by the gate, does not enter by the door, by the entrance, which is Jesus, and he calls those who don't enter by the door thieves and robbers. Thieves and robbers are not wolves, but they are people who would end up in the sheep pen, not through the gate or the door, who's Jesus, but by means of climbing over or going under the wall to get into the sheep pen. Now listen, the sheep pen is not heaven, but it signifies the church of the living God. And Jesus is making known that some are in the fold physically, but not spiritually. They are not in the church as sheep, but as thieves and robbers. They take away from the gospel, not necessarily by teaching anything that's false, but by the way that they live and influencing others. Because here's the thing, most of us believe that the gospel is just some type of moral change in our life. But that's not the gospel. It is a transformation through the work of the Holy Spirit working in us and God drawing us to himself. And our response is to repent to change direction, to stop trying to do things our own way. You can go and do a bunch of programs if you just want to be a morally better person, but Jesus Christ changes from the inside out. So these thieves and robbers, they're not in as sheep, but they do influence people by being an imposter and justifying themselves because they're in the sheep pen, but not as sheep, but as thieves and robbers. Jesus, in verse 3 of chapter 10, speaks of the gatekeeper, the one who may open the gate. And the gatekeeper are not the point. The shepherd is, but the function of the gatekeeper is to allow access into the sheep pen for the shepherd's sheep. See, The gatekeeper could signify pastors and elders in the church of the living God. So those of us who have a responsibility to not block access for sheep, to follow the shepherd's voice into the sheep pen, the church through the gate, and also to stop access for those who are not the sheep of the shepherd who maybe want to destroy the sheep that are in the pen. But now we hear of the hired hands, which easily, I think if you just read it real fast, would be assumed that these are just paid staff. They're just hired hands. They're just hirelings is another word for it. But remember who Jesus is speaking to at the beginning of chapter 10, verse 1. He says, very truly, I tell you, Pharisees. Jesus says that the hired hand is not the shepherd and he does not own the sheep. So if you're still wondering who he's implying, I believe he's implying the Pharisees are the hired hands. They believed they were the shepherds, maybe not literally, but figuratively because they were keepers of the law. They taught the law. That in their legalistic point of view, it was only those who kept the law, like them, that were really God's people. They really deserved to be in the sheep fold. But Jesus says, he comes to this world and he says, it's not by keeping the law, but by trusting me who kept the law for you that you're made right. So when the hired hand sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. 
The wolf is not the point that Jesus is making, but it can be assumed that the wolf means the devil. But the wolf represents danger. It represents discomfort and trial that a hired hand simply would not put up with. Because they, unlike Christ, are unwilling to lay down their lives for the sheep. The wolf comes to attack and scatter, and we've seen it over and over and over again in church ministry. When things get hard and difficult, hired hands, religious leaders get up and run. And the sheep aren't as important as the job, the comfort, or the resume. So they run away. See, I don't want to act real quick. I don't want to act that I, like I'm above that church. I have moments, literally often, where I wonder why I ever listened to God when he called me into the pastorate. Mike gets that because he's in it now too. See, I'm not able to do the duties that are in my job description without God's intercession. They are impossible without him. And that's the point. It's not what we can do for God. It's what he can do through us that makes a difference. That's what we ought to look to, especially when times are difficult and they're feeling impossible. And when you're leading people, if any of you have relationships, discipleship relationships, where you're investing in someone, I bet you they drive you nuts. And that's part of the sanctification process for you. Verse 13. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. And this is a judgment that Jesus has on the Pharisees and the council that believe because of their let me put in air quotes, pure doctrine that they were better than others, that they were everyone's leaders because they claimed that they kept the law. Today, we see people get into ministry for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> I kind of feel like I did. See, I, I got into ministry almost two decades ago because I like detention, if I'm honest. Sometimes we get into ministry because we want fame or we want to be able to lead people and we can really make it about ourselves. Shepherding is where it's at, though. And if my 28-year-old self could hear my 38-year-old self say that, he would slap me. Because shepherding truly is where it is at. You know why I know that? Because I've sat with many of you. I've been there when your spouse died. I've been there when you've been going through something with your children. I've been able to sit with you and encourage you and pray for you. I've been able to be there when you need to be told, no, that's wrong. And it's the shepherding that God allows me as an under-shepherd, not the good shepherd. I am nowhere near him. But as the under-shepherd to lead and help guide and to point people to Christ and what he has done. Uh, I wasn't very good at school. I know that's shocking to all of you. It's not shocking to Sarah. She handles my slides. I was good at speech and debate, though. Shocking. I was the master of ceremonies on student council most of the years that I was in elementary school and middle school, unless I was being suspended or expelled. That's when I wasn't. But here's the thing. I've always known how to talk. I've always known how to communicate. But I've learned that being able to communicate on Sunday what we're doing right now in real time, where the word of God is open and we are teaching it, it is really important that we do this. It's really important that, that those who claim they're Christ's sheep are a part of hearing the word of God. And if you miss it because you're having a really good time elsewhere, I understand. But listen to the sermon. Because we want to help people all be on the same page. And we record it. We put it on podcast because we want to make sure people are on the same page. But here's the real ministry. It's sitting with people in the hard times. The real ministry is sitting with the people in the hardest of times. The real ministry is sitting with the people in the fun times and the in-between times and the waiting times. You know why? Because that's what a shepherd does. Shepherding God's people isn't for the faint of heart, but it is a privilege and an opportunity to love God's people on God's behalf. And may we never forget that. It is a privilege to shepherd God's people and an opportunity to love God's people on God's behalf. And whenever we are being used for God's purposes, we must know that he is the one doing the heavy lifting, that he is the one that's using this to conform and reform and transform and refine us more into the image of Jesus Christ. 
this is overlooked often in church ministry in today's ever-changing culture because we conform the church into the image of a business organization that will put efficiency before the assembly because we've learned more leadership principles from culture than we have from the word of God. Verse 14, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Jesus makes known what he thinks about himself. He differentiates himself from the hired hands, from the thieves and robbers, and even the gatekeeper. He is the good shepherd. And what does the good shepherd know? The good shepherd knows his sheep. He knows his sheep. He knows them by name. He has known them prior to the creation of the world. And being known by God is a salvation term that means because we are known by him, we have a relationship with him. Have you ever heard Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship? I mean, that's true. Sounds kind of weird. I have a t-shirt that says this. I don't wear it because I think it's kind of lame. But the point is true. Nothing is more important than our being known by God. But this doesn't happen through us being really good or bad like a child trying to get attention. This is through God's grace and God's grace alone that we can know him through Jesus Christ. It is by grace alone that we are known by God. We see this in scripture time and time again. We are not saved by what we do, but we are saved by what God has done. Ephesians 2, it is our go-to passage. Mike's preached it a few times. I've preached it a few times. When I ask other people to preach, they're like, can I preach Ephesians 2? And I'm like, no, because we always preach it. But here it is. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Let me, let me point out something that I always like to point out in this passage. Um, who gave us grace according to this passage? Very good, God. I would have accepted God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Good Shepherd. I would have accepted all of those answers. Great. According to this verse, who gives you your faith? God. God gives us the faith to believe and trust him. And this is not by works so that no one can boast. Woo! The fact that we can see Jesus for who he is, that our eyes have been opened spiritually, that we can hear him and what he actually has to communicate, it's because God intervened. And Jesus says that he knows us, that we know him. We know that Jesus reveals about himself specific things in scripture that are hard for the world to understand. We don't have to guess at who Jesus is. The scriptures teach us. The scripture is the living, active word of God, and we don't have to recreate Jesus into our image. God is knowable, not just through our intellect, but through experiencing and obeying this God who calls to himself us and gives us his spirit to know and grow and show him off. I've done ministry in some capacity for almost two decades now. And especially having the opportunity to invest in people who are new in the faith. And I don't know what you think of when you hear new in the faith. You might think, oh, like they just prayed a prayer. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about miles on the odometer. And miles on the odometer doesn't mean you've sat in the church. It means that you've actually obeyed what he said. Okay? Because your odometer doesn't move if you're being towed. <laughs> Write that down. That's pretty good. <laughs> But I've seen people come to faith, get really excited about Jesus, and then after just a certain amount of time, and it's always different for everybody, but generally it's when hard things come up, they start to peter out. They have times where they're not as passionate as they once were. Can we just be honest? This is all of us. Can we be real? Just me? You guys are liars. All right, nine of us. Praise God. But I like to remind us what the writer of Hebrews says. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know who didn't change? Him. So for those of you who are struggling, it may not even be a belief issue. I'd contend that most of the time it's an obedience issue. We feel as if Jesus is farther away than he actually is, but we struggle to hear his voice because we don't obey when we do hear it. So our heart hardens, and we refuse to follow the shepherd, 
We refuse to believe he protects us. And then when things get really hard, we start to bite at the shepherd, don't we? Or even the gatekeeper. Because we keep wondering why he doesn't seem close or why what he says isn't working, and yet we're not putting it into practice. So like reading a book on how to clean your house, but never cleaning the house, that doesn't work. Weird. But maybe we should read this and actually put it into practice because we love him. See, it's of no use to not do what he says. And the Bible just being preached at you or you reading it, not thinking there's a responsibility to be done with it, is misinterpreting Christianity at the most basic form. Jesus' church, Jesus' people, they are doers of the word. Doing the word doesn't justify you, Jesus does. But because he has, we do what he says out of love. See, obedience proceeds from love. It comes from an understanding that we love him, and because we love him, we can do what he says, and we want to do what he says. Verse 15. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. See, Jesus knows his sheep, and the sheep know him, just as the Father knows Jesus, and Jesus knows the Father. This is the eternal knowledge that one has when they've trusted Jesus. And this eternal knowledge, this knowing Jesus, Understanding that Jesus knows us, this is not fleeting, it's not forgettable, and it's not fair weather. See, this eternal knowledge of Jesus Christ, it's intimate, it's love-bearing, and it's active. As we trust him and we do the things that he says, and so the God that we believe in, the triune God, one God, three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they're in perfect union he is in perfect union. They are in perfect union in relationship with one another. And as followers of Jesus, as his sheep, bah, we too get to be in a relationship, not just with him, but with one another. And eternity, what we're going towards, the fact that we get to spend eternity with God because of what Jesus has done, there will be no sin in eternity. There will be no pain in heaven, just perfect union with God. So Christians, that's where we're headed. That's what we can be excited about. That's the hope that we point to. And that is what we get to practice for eternity, even starting now. The shepherd sacrifices for a sheep. The, the good shepherd sacrifices for a sheep. And our good shepherd lays down his life for us. He died in our place. He came to the earth that would reject him. So those who did receive him would have access to God. Through Jesus, through his sacrifice, through his mercy, through his grace and forgiveness, we are able to come to the Father because Jesus laid down his life for a sheep. Real quick, this is a good sermon. You know why? Because it's about the gospel. May I just say that people suck the life out of you when you're trying to care for them? But if we're serving the Lord, if we're shepherding people as conduits of grace, as conduits of the good shepherd, the prize is worth it. You hear that, elders? You hear that, staff? You hear that, followers of Jesus? To shepherd people, the prize is worth it. Not that we get more of heaven. Take your mansion theology somewhere else. That's not what happens. We get Jesus, and he's worth it. Bringing him glory by doing what he says for the right reasons and growing in the process to look more like him is always worth it. Verse 16. Jesus says, I have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. All right. I love when scripture makes people argue. There have been arguments over centuries about what Jesus is implying here, and this is part of the figure of speech, and there was a great theologian, Augustine, who spoke about this, and he believed that this was for people who believed in Christ but had nothing to do with God's sheep pen, had nothing to do with his church. And even though that, for some of us, would make more sense because it's a current interpretation, Jesus, I believe, meant that the other sheep 
were the Gentiles. They weren't the Jews. They weren't just the Jews. It wasn't God just drew the Jews to himself. He also drew the Gentiles. Here's what a Gentile is, not a Jew. Simple definition. So most of you, actually all of you, because none of you were pure, probably, I'm guessing. And so God drew the Gentiles to himself as well, and he's speaking of this. He's foreshadowing what's going to happen. I believe that he meant these other sheep were the Gentiles, those who are yet to have been told about Christ and his work. But God draws those who did not have the law as their reminder of God's faithfulness. He draws the other ones too, the ones that don't know how important it is to keep the law, not for salvation, but to point you to Jesus. God's plan all along was to save people from all tribes, all tongues, all nations, and the power of the gospel is not for a nationality. Do you hear me? The power of the gospel is not a skin color, but any type of people that God in his grace decides to draw to be his own people, not connected by skin color or opinions, but by grace, bound by his blood that was shed so forgiveness could be had. Woo, heaven's gonna not look like certain things that we're used to doing. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone, everyone who believes, first to Jew, then to Gentile. God's plan was for all types of people to become his people. Heaven isn't light or dark-skinned. Heaven is a reflection of the glory of God. Verse 17. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. Jesus was submissive in every way to the father. He was obedient even unto death. His love for the father propelled him to complete sacrifice, and he laid down his life. And he can take it up again. See, love without sacrifice of self is not biblical love. Love without sacrifice of self is not biblical love. Verse 18. No one takes it from me, Jesus says, but I lay it down on my own accord. That has nothing to do with the car. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. When I was an associate pastor at a church in uh, more south than here, I spoke of the time that Jesus was killed. I was preaching, and I probably may have said that Jesus was murdered. And at that time, I was number two in the church. I was rebuked by the lead pastor because the theological understanding is that no one killed Jesus, but he laid down his life. Now, see, I agree with that. Jesus says this. But in a practical sense, the Roman guards put Jesus on a cross and put him to death. And the point is that Jesus is God and has the power to lay down his life and take it back up again because he's God. And the resurrection of Jesus is the all-time greatest drop of a mic in history. I'm back. Verse 19. The Jews who heard these words were divided again. Um, Jesus does divide. I'm, I just got to be real about that. There are people in your family that think you're nuts for following Jesus. There are people at work that think you're crazy for following Jesus. There are people that are very important to you that don't understand why you would lay down your life for the one who laid down his life for you. And rarely do all people hear the same thing the same way when the word of God is being taught because we all come from different contexts and believe different things. But it, he did this. He made these outlandish claims because he wanted to speak about the fact that, you know what, you, you may disagree with this, but some are going to believe. Verse 20, many of them said he is demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? The usual response to Jesus, or really anyone that tells you the truth, church, is for you not to like it. That's your response. It's to go after the messenger's character, isn't it? How dare you say that about me? You wore two different types of socks last week. 
They assumed that what he was saying wasn't from God, so instead what did they do? They blamed dark forces and his sanity. But then it says in verse 21, but others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? What I love about some of the people in these crowds are the logic. That even though what they are hearing isn't what they're used to, maybe it's not what they want to hear, maybe it's not how they would see the Messiah, what he did proved he was not just some magician, but that he had the power to heal people. See, remember, this all came out of Jesus healing a man born blind. He had the power to heal people and to use it as a sign to point to the fact that he is who he says that he is. So you want to know what Jesus used miracles for? He used them as a sign to point to his deity. He used miracles as a sign to point to his deity. And I cannot tell you how much this thinking and this type of question resonates with me. These are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Many of you probably know this, but I grew up without any real Christian examples. No one taught me the Bible. I had nothing to do with Christianity. I just thought y'all were weird. My father was an antagonistic agnostic, which meant you'd argue with him, and then when you made a good point, he'd go, I don't care. He thought he was too scientific to believe in God. But after I became a Christian, I realized that he didn't have a belief problem, he had a submission problem, like most of us. But what did God use specifically in my life to open my eyes to the fact that Jesus is who he says that he is? It's simply because he rose from the dead. The resurrection from the dead is the linchpin for me and the linchpin for Christianity to believe that God is who he says that he is. See, I say it would be intellectual suicide for me at this point to walk away from Jesus based on what I know of the resurrection. When I dug into the facts of what happened in Jerusalem in 33 AD, following Jesus being put on a cross, when I read the things that skeptics and scholars all agreed upon regarding what happened after Jesus' death, I came to the conclusion that it would take more faith to believe he didn't rise than to believe that he did. For 2,000 years, people have believed that he rose from the dead. The disciples who aren't now, they were right then. The apostles, the people who saw Jesus alive after he died, were willing to go to gruesome deaths, attempting to convince others of what they believed, not because someone else convinced them, but because of what they experienced. See, the resurrection is not only a big deal. The scriptures constantly point to the resurrection. They constantly point to the fact that it is the linchpin for the Christian faith and the Christian belief system. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14. We're going to have Easter a little early. Here's what it says. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. I sat in a library. Remember those? I sat in a library And I was reading this as a skeptical 20-year-old. I was like, I want nothing to do with this Jesus guy. I don't want to believe him, blah, blah, blah. And I read this verse, and here was my thought. If I'm going to try to convince you of something, if I'm going to write a book to get you to believe in something, I'm not going to tell you the way to get out of that something in the book. But Paul lays it out. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. So don't argue about Christians. We suck the life out of people. Argue with the resurrection. Let me know when you want to get baptized. Because if you're going to make up a book, you're not going to tell people how to get out of it, and the resurrection has so much history on its side. Consistently, Scripture points to the resurrection of being the way that we can trust the message of the gospel. Acts chapter 17 Verse 30 and 31, Paul's speaking at Areopagus, he's speaking in Athens, and he says, in the past God looked over such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, to change direction, to stop making it about themselves, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And how do we know that he appointed this man? He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. So I simply just want to close with a passage. I'm not going to ask you to come down an aisle. 
I just want to encourage you that if you haven't truly made the resurrected king, the king of your heart, the king of your life, repent, because he's worth it. I'm just going to read what the writer of Hebrews said later on in Hebrews chapter 13. He says in verse 20, Now may the God of peace, this is my prayer for you, May the God of peace, who through the blood of our eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen.